The seller claims the tip of the headstock has been broken off cleanly and at some point reattached. It's cosmetic and barely noticeable. Welcome back, troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. I've got a basket full of colorful guitars for you guys tonight, and we're going to start off with this eBay listing of a 1991 Gibson M3 Deluxe. So we just recently talked about the Gibson M3 series. You can check out this episode if you need a recap, but essentially there's a whole bunch of different models in varying different finishes and specs, but not a single one of them left the factory looking like this. So I was quite intrigued by this auction because there wasn't a lot of bids on it until the very end. So somebody has given it a deluxe lot lime green finish with some sparkles built into it, and then give it a very 90s aesthetic with some blue laid on top. It gives me very similar vibes to this Melody Maker that we've talked about before. It just screams the 90s. And even though it's a refinish on a guitar that normally if you refinish it, you lose a lot of value, these just had new life breathed into them. And as far as refinish work goes, this one appears to be semi what professional. They left our original pit guard alone, which is great because those things do shrink and off gas, unfortunately. I'm finding that out the hard way. Just why I need more guitars in my collection that can't be kept in a case with their pit guards on. But the whole leopard vibes of the original guard really pairs well with this new finish. It looks like either the neck pickup was replaced or flipped at that point in time, which honestly throws off the entire vibe of the guitar. That's why this thing looks so strange, because that's what's cool about the M3. They have two zebras with that middle pickup being cream, so it kind of gives you the vibe. From far away, it's just three single coils, but this one, it looks like your neck pickup has been slightly shifted down, and then you got a middle. he has got all kinds of wonkiness going on there. But the NSX pickup is still there, and the seller claims it's the original 500T 496R, but it looks like as far as the design, it is only on the face of the guitar that is not carved. So any of the edges, they just left that alone. Flipping over to the backside, unfortunately, it's just a straight up metallic green. Something going on here. I'm not sure if that's a paint blemish or what, but now this reminds me of the 2010's reissue of the Gibson M3. That one actually had a lime green. So I think that's the true reason why this was not so offensive to me, is because it kind of already exists. This one's just a true vintage example, but it looks like they might have put a satin finish on the back of the neck. It's kind of hard to tell, but the headstock looks like they relatively left it alone, and I'd say the face of the board looks good. But now what I started the episode off on, I love this seller because he wanted to be as open and honest as humanly possible. He sold this the way he thought it was. It was repaired and cleanly repaired at some point. But my friend, no, this is just a natural join line. Gibson has to use multiple pieces to make these necks up. What you're seeing here is just a piece of wood that happens to be a slightly different color than the maple that's over here. But there's no way that has ever separated with the serial number still looking so clean. Unless he's talking about a different area on the headstock. Because sometimes a headstock does separate and you have to re-glue it, and maybe that did happen and the refinish cured that, but as we were talking earlier, that headstock face looks pretty clean to me, and you would have had a broken veneer and stuff like that. But I can't help but laugh because I know, in the past, I have shot myself in the foot. I've advertised something the exact same way before I knew how everything was constructed. But this one also had the original case, so I was actually bidding on this one. Way before the auction ended, I put a thousand bucks in the ring, and then, unfortunately, I, I forgot about it. It went all the way up to about 1300 bucks all in. That was a very fair price for as unique as this one is with the case. I honestly think listed properly on Reverb, somebody might pay 1800 bucks if the finish is nice. That's the hard thing with refinished guitars online. You can never tell if it feels good in person just by photos because some refinishes look a lot better than they actually are. So congratulations to whoever picked that up. I hope you enjoy it, you 90s monster, you. But next up, I want to feature another custom art guitar that was shared by Gary Spaniola over on a Facebook group. Now, before I show it to you, this is described as a Gibson 1977 Les Paul Pro. And apparently he's got a book coming out where this guitar is also featured in it. You can check it out on his website if you want to. He's claiming that all the money from the book is going to St. Jude's Children's Hospital. As always, do your own research before sending money to people. I just want to talk about this cool Les Paul. But before I show it to you, you're watching the Trogley's Guitar Show, I gotta school you on this model. Okay, so the Pro Deluxe was a model in the late 70s. Essentially, what made them different is they had stock P90 pickups that were called the Laid Back pickup back then. So this replaces the mini humbuckers in a regular Deluxe that you see over there. And for whatever reason, they just got stock ebony fretboards. 
Other than that, they are identical to other Deluxe. However, I do find that the Pro Deluxe tend to be incredibly heavy guitars. So typically, you'll find them in ebony finishes, tobacco sunburst, and very rarely you can find the gold top. I do need to get one of these in for review and documentation, because I did used to own one, but I never got around to making the video while I had owned it. But a cool little fact about the Les Paul Pro is that's actually the model that Journey's Neil Sean used pretty much throughout his career. Now, by the end of it all, it had a Floyd Rose on it. It was basically turned into the world's first Access Custom, which then birthed his own signature model in the early 2000s, which are very rare. And this was just recently auctioned off. You can learn more about it in this episode. But it's also got the Sustainiac pickup in it. It's got a whole bunch of weird stuff going on. But this started life as a pro deluxe, as you can see by our truss rod cover. But wait until you see this interesting one. Oh, hello there, friendly peacock with a flower in its mouth. <laughs> This is so beautiful. Whoever did this artwork, you did a fantastic job. It's got such bright, vibrant, lovely colors. The blue and red contrasts well against the dark purples and the darker blues, and then you get the tail feathers. The only thing I have to critique here is I really wish they wouldn't have painted over the binding because it just kind of makes the guitar look like a studio, unfortunately. But looking over here, we don't have the P90 pickups anymore. Somebody has routed it out for humbuckers. So that's a bit of a shame. It also looks like somebody's refretted it because we do not have fret nibs, but at least we do still have the binding on the neck, which can kind of help back up the story that maybe it was a Les Paul Pro Deluxe at one point in time. But then we flip it over to the backside. It looks like Gary might actually be the artist here because we have the GS signature here on the back, but you've got the continuation of the peafowl feathers. But then get this, okay, I'm seeing it for the first time. Peacocks, they're feathers, they've got the eyes. We've got the eyes hidden within the purple. <laughs> I like that. And now that I've seen it on the back, I see it on the front too. But I've always liked animal influenced guitars. But hey, there's one more Easter egg hiding on here. Looks like we got the name Julie Cakes. So maybe this was a collaborative project. I guess you'd have to buy the book to find out. But that's not the only Easter egg. Look, we got the diamond posi lock strap box on this. That's a little bit too early to see it stock. Like, yeah, some the less balls got them early. But as far as a pro deluxe, yeah, probably added a couple years after the fact. But I'd love to see the headstock and see what they might have done there, but that's the only three photos that he shared at the time that I had found it. Next up here, somebody reached out to me asking for a private help session about a guitar that he's owned for quite some time, and he was just kind of unsure what exactly is it. Because if you look at the Gibson Custom Shop Certificate of Authenticity for this thing, it says Les Paul Jr. SC. Serial number of the 771988. Yep, that all matches, so huh, Les Paul Jr. SC. My first impression is SC might stand for single cut, you know, instead of the Les Paul Jr. double cut. But then when you look at the photos of the guitar, ah, uh, Gibson, that, that, that's very clearly a Les Paul special because you've got two P90s here. Juniors, they typically look like this. They've got one. They have a significantly different pick guard design because of that and they only ever have a master volume, master tone. This guy, it's got both of them. It's got the special pick guard. It's got the dual volumes and dual tones. So what's going on here? I mean, at least it's a single cut, so we know SC very well might stand for that, but we've got a regular rosewood fretboard. And then we've got a headstock. I mean, it says Les Paul Jr., so it must be a junior, right? Wiring looks okay. You've got your bumblebee capacitors. It even has all the case candy in the custom shop case. So what on earth is going on here? This to me screams limited edition dealer run, a small run the custom shop did for poops and giggles. I guess it could be a custom order, but generally, I don't think you would see them get so specific here. This has to be a small run of some sort. Now, some of the more astute viewers might already see what is wrong with this piece and why it is called a junior instead of a special. But for those of us that don't understand, let's walk this through step by step. This is what a vintage 54 junior looks like. Pay special attention to our fretboard. It is unbound. Our headstock has a gold Gibson silk screen. A Les Paul Special has a bound fretboard and an inlaid Gibson Mother of Pearl logo. So when we come back over to this one, it doesn't have the binding. It doesn't have the Gibson Mother of Pearl logo. So basically, this is a Les Paul Jr. that's been dressed up just a little bit more with a neck pickup and a new pick guard and some added controls, but not dressed up quite enough to make it a full-on Les Paul Special. 
So as far as desirability of this particular guitar, eh, it's mainly a quirky collector's piece. I wouldn't expect you'd get a huge premium. In fact, I'm pretty sure most people would just scorn this example and be like, nah, I don't want that, unless they're just building a quirky collection. But it is kind of cool that the custom shop would build something like that. Because generally speaking, custom ordering something like that really wouldn't make much financial sense. So I thought it was worthy of sharing. But to wrap up things tonight, since we've got just a little bit of time left, ah, uh, somebody sent me uh, a steampunk strat that had a, a built-in flamethrower. <laughs> I really like steampunk guitars, but I am really, really, really picky with them. Some of them look fantastic. Other ones, they don't quite pull it off. And unfortunately, despite all the effort and all the coolness that they do have going on here, I don't think this one works. But it's far from the worst I've ever seen. Like, I like that we got these giant chain belts going on here. The cut through pit guard exposing some stuff there. And of course, steampunk is never complete without some vacuum tubes. But this one just straight up has a flamethrower on the side of it. Okay. As if steampunk guitars don't get heavy enough. Let's add more. But they really did put a whole bunch of layers on here. So I'm not saying this is terrible. I just like it when we have some like built-in lights and other stuff going on. But ah, okay, I like that. I would assume this was like some laser etching done onto the back of the guitar in a cool floral, almost paisley-like pattern. And then that neck looks incredibly uncomfortable to play. But let's be real here. If you got a flamethrower off the side of your guitar, I don't think you're really meant to be play playing this. I guess the big question is, does it work? No. Ah. <laughs> I don't know, maybe that's just for legal reasons this guitar is not playable and this flamethrower does not work. <laughs> But oh cool, he does answer how much it weighs. Only 15 pounds. That's not too much more than a Norland era custom on a bad day. But this has been listed for six months. It's by Lapsteels by George.com. He wants 2400 bucks. But he is forthcoming and saying it's a no-name copy of a Fender Stratocaster. You're basically just paying for the work and artistry. If you agree, it is worth that much. And if it does tickle your fancy and you've got your tetanus shot, you can make an offer. All right, troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed this fun, very diverse episode. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day. And you might even enjoy this next one.